Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We are pleased to be hosting our second of our webinar series for Remix. And so today's topic is Redesigning Transit at a Major Scale, the Baltimore Link Story. So a little bit about our webinar series and our Remix Transit Talks. A couple of goals I just wanted to outline for today and other transit talks that we'll be hosting in the future. A couple of goals for these programs is one, to connect users across our Remix network. So we have over 650 Remix users around the United States and some internationally. To share best practices from the transit community. So in addition to hearing about things like major transit redesigns like we're going to hear about today from Michael Walk, uh, other uh, types of service plans that might be going on and, and how to share some of those best practices from one agency to the other. And finally, to generally preview Remix product updates, we often are updating our software and want to be able to make sure we get that information out to our users in a timely fashion. So a little bit about Remix for those that are not familiar. We are a software company that de develops transit planning software for transit agencies. Uh, we are based in San Francisco, and I'd like to really state that we are a community of transit believers. Our team is uh, focused 100% on transit agencies, and our software is developed specifically for the needs of transit planners. A little bit about us, we've been around for about 14 months now, and we're working with over 80 agencies around the United States uh, to help them plan better transit in their communities. Now to move on to today's featured presenter, I'm pleased to welcome Michael Walk, who is the former Director of Service Development at the Maryland Transit Administration. His first role at the MTA was to design and implement the agency's first performance program, and based on his own performance, he was later promoted to be the agency's free, first chief performance officer where his team collected, analyzed, and reported on the important metrics critical to the MTA's business decisions. Through his efforts, MTA was able to cut its operational overtime budget by nearly half over four years, which equates to about $30 million. He later went on to oversee the team's service planning department that included the responsibility of a nearly $2 million operating budget and a staff of 38 people. In this capacity, Michael led the Bus Network Improvement Project, or BNEP, which we'll describe a little bit more in today's presentation. Most recently, he has taken a new role as a transit researcher at the Texas Transportation Institute in Austin, Texas, where he'll apply his love for transit, analytical, and leadership skills to benefit transit agencies across the United States. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Michael as our first presenter. All right, thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get into uh, my presentation today. And um, give me one second here. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the story of uh, Baltimore, uh, about the Baltimore Link Project, and how um, through technology, uh, Remix and other technologies, as well as teams of people, we were able to do a complete bus system overhaul in uh, a very short amount of time and uh, get our plans out to the public for them to look at. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. Now, uh, just a little bit of, of what I'm going to be covering. So, you know, uh, Paul already gave you an introduction as to as who I am. I, you know, I was with the Maryland Transit Administration, or the MTA, for seven years in several different roles. My involvement in Baltimore Link, I was really a co-manager uh, of Baltimore Link project uh, with a co colleague of mine, Kevin Quinn. And uh, I've been at the Texas A&M Transport Tran Transportation Institute uh, for 13 days. So I just recently changed jobs and I'm based in the Austin, Texas office. Uh, so I will talk to you about the Baltimore Link overview of what was Baltimore Link, which is our big service uh, overhaul, and uh, where did it come from, why, what role Remix played in our planning as well as in our training and education, and uh, how we worked in Remix in order to get things done. So, the, uh, so let's get started first with just what Baltimore Link was and do a little bit of overview about Baltimore Link. So Baltimore Link is the name for a, a multi-component plan that has many different pieces to it, uh, many of which are depicted on this slide here, that both operating and capital investments. And um, really where Remix comes in and what I'll focus on today is how we completely uh, redesigned the bus network in order for it to work better uh, with our region and with the rail infrastructure that already exists. And um, also we introduced a new type of service that we called CityLink. Well, we were planning, you know, this part of the plan uh, is to introduce this new type of service called CityLink, our high-frequency bus system. Um, so what's the history of Baltimore Link? So Baltimore Link really started back in 2013 with a project that was called the Bus Network Improvement Project, or BNIP. Uh, BNIP was started in 2013, and it had several components and several goals. And really, the, the crux of BNIP 
was to better align the network with the development patterns and job centers that have been changing in the region. Um, you know, and the bus system hadn't been overhauled in over 10 years, and uh, this was the first time in 10 years where we were really looking, taking a hard look at all of the routes, where they went, and trying to make them work better for the area. Of course, we did a lot of data analysis in order to try to accomplish that. We took an assessment of the current uh, system. These are just some graphics that are pulled from our report of, you know, uh, the, the routes, how well were they performing, what was their ridership look like. We also looked at the region's demographics. Uh, we calculated something called a regional uh, transit propensity index. And so uh, these red blotches on the map are the areas in the Baltimore region, uh, which would greatly benefit from a uh, good transit service as a function of uh, density of population and income and several other factors. Um, of course, that's not all. You know, data analysis is important, but also customer outreach. And so we did uh, several outreach events. Um, and so this is just a photo from one of our workshops. And uh, we asked the public to come in and talk to us about the bus system, how they felt about it. Was it working? Was it not working? What needed to change in order to make it work better for them? So we had that data background and then the public outreach to help us create a plan. Now, the plan we put together was really a fiscally unconstrained plan in terms of operating costs. Uh, we, you know, we weren't allowed to add any significant capital expenses, like we couldn't build a new rail line or a BRT or anything like that. But it's really, we could add more service. And, and uh, part of what happened with uh, BNIP is that the cost of the plan to fully implement it uh, was more than uh, the times could bear. And so really the, the BNIP plan uh, got stalled due to financial and political issues. And so in Maryland, we had a lot of turnover um, in the political ranks and changes of administration from the governor of the state all the way down to the uh, leader of the MTA. And so uh, for a time, we thought BNIP was kind of on hiatus or in purgatory or pick your metaphor, and uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen with it, um, and just trying to keep it alive as best we could. And then all of a sudden, um, it was reborn. Uh, so BNIP, you know, uh, came back to life. And uh, we had a new administration at the MTA that was really, really interested in improving bus transit. They wanted the system to work better, and they wanted to lift up the region with uh, good transit investments. They were willing to actually spend money on public transit and make it work better. And so they, uh, you know, not only were they interested in getting this, in, in getting a plan done, they wanted to get it out to the public very quickly. And so um, all of a sudden, after a long, long time of nothing, um, we then we're given the mandate to create a whole new plan for the region, um, and we have to get it out in less than 60 days. And uh, so, of course, you know, from transit planner time, 60 days is not a whole lot of time. And uh, so we had a lot of work to do, and it wouldn't have been possible without the technology that we had and the teams of people working on it to get it done. So we really took BNIP's DNA, that data that we did, and the public outreach, and um, we added a multimodal focus. So we had the improvements to train service, and then we had bike improvements and several other pieces. We put that all together and packaged it up, created it as Baltimore Link. With Baltimore Link, we also had additional goals and an added focus. So one of the additional goals under Baltimore Link uh, that wasn't present for BNIP was uh, to keep operating cost level. So our goal here was to try to redesign the, the the bus system and the transit system without adding significantly to operating costs. We tried to keep the service about the same across the board. And uh, we also wanted to implement a frequent grid of service and make that service easy to understand. So that was you know, part of our approach under Baltimore Link that really wasn't present under BNIP. So when we released the Baltimore Link uh, plan to the public, um, you know, it had several different components. These just kind of give you an overview of the different types of service that we were proposing. We rebranded all of our services under the, 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 uh, the Link brand. And so we had three different types of bus service. We have a City Link, uh, Local Link, and Express Bus Link. And I'll unpack uh, these a little bit for you, as well as our paratransit service and then our subway and light rail lines. All of these services share the same fare structure pretty much. And so um, it made sense putting them all together. And they all serve the core of the Baltimore metropolitan region. So I wanted to unpack the City Link. City Link was a was a particular important concept to our service plan under Baltimore Link, and it was the introduction of these high frequency routes. And uh, there were 12 of them all together in our original plan. They were color coded. They operated 24 hours of service per day, and um, 
they serve the major regional corridors in the Baltimore uh, region. And so the map on the left here just kind of gives you an idea. It's not, uh, in terms of scale, I'm sure it's hard to understand exactly what you're looking at. But um, Baltimore is served by several major radial arterial streets that all feed into the downtown area. We don't have a lot of interstate pass-throughs. And so a majority of the traffic that's trying to get into the downtown area uh, is coming in along these arterials. And that's also where the city built out a lot of its density is along these arterial streets. And so that's a great places to put transit. And so we put high frequency transit there called City Link, our City Link routes. Those City Link routes all serve those radio corridors that come into the downtown region. And then here on the map on the right is a zoom in of the gray of this downtown area here on the left. We're zooming in and looking at it on the right. And so it basically forms a high frequency transit grid of City Link services in that downtown central Baltimore area that includes the CBD uh, as well as other key areas in the Baltimore region. Every one of these city link routes we planned in advance um, and succeeded that they all would touch each other. That is, every city link route connects to every other city link route, and every city link route also connects to light rail, our, uh, our light rail line and our metro line. So it creates a sort of one transfer system where you're guaranteed that if you're on a city link route, you can get to any other bus stop on city link or any other train station in one transfer. Um, and so that was our premise. The CityLink kind of formed the skeleton, the back, uh, the rib cage, so to speak, of the transit system. And then there's lots of other routes that fill in the gaps where, um, where those don't run. And we call those local links. Now, um, this is just a, an idea on how we restructure the central Baltimore network. And uh, you can see here as a map, we have all these uh, current bus routes, that's today's service, uh, before Baltimore Link that gets implemented, uh, coming in from our radial streets, and pretty much everything um, in the in this region comes in and funnels in through a basic sort of transit mall that's been set up here on a couple of major streets uh, traveling east-west. Now, uh, the big problem we have with that is the facilities in this area just aren't large enough to accommodate the bus volumes, and so our buses actually have bus-on-bus -bus congestion all the time in this corridor and uh, creates a lot of additional delay and not everybody's trying to get down to that area. So we decided under Baltimore Link to spread the high quality service out. Like don't funnel it all down into this small area uh, right in the CBD, but let's, also, let's serve the CBD, uh, which is actually uh, really located right in here. Let's serve that, but then also still spread the wealth of the service throughout the rest of the city, making the city someplace easier to live in and get around in. And so this is the City Link service uh, and zoomed into that downtown area. And I just like switching back and forth between these two maps because hopefully you can get the big difference in terms of the grid, um, the, the continuity of travel east-west and north-south across the different corridors that wasn't really present in the previous network. And that's one of our proudest accomplishments is pulling off this high-frequency grid of CityLink route. Now, um, just in terms of what we accomplished, you know, as the plan as we released it, um, we really focused on frequent transit, so we, we, we improved the uh, number of jobs and people that have access to frequent transit lines. There's 37% more jobs and 34% more people will have access to frequent transit under Baltimore Link. We also increased the amount of service we have on the street, and you can see some of the statistics there regarding service area and uh, how many people will have access to transit. We still maintain uh, current rider access to transit over 99%, actually we'll still have access to transit within a quarter mile. And uh, so we're really proud of that accomplishment, sir. You know, we know that it isn't perfect yet, and we went to public comment and all. And I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what we did for public engagement. So we released the plan back in October 22nd, 2015. Uh, we started immediately an online engagement website using a platform called My Sidewalk. And uh, that site is still up uh, and uh, at least effective February 8th, 2016. And I'm um, hoping we'll be up for the remainder of the Baltimore Link uh, engagement. We also conducted a total of 13 workshops. And uh, these are just, uh, we held those workshops throughout the uh, Baltimore region. You can see a map of workshops here. And um, these workshops were very well attended. We had a lot of people come out. Um, this is sort of a panorama of one of our workshops. Uh, we had a, these uh, hands-on maps and comment stations where people could come learn of what we are proposing, and then also uh, provide comment right there using laptops or cards. Um, and some additional staff looking at a full system map of our proposed network. We also held uh, pop-up events, we called them. Uh, we held a total of four of them at major transit hubs. Basically pulled this bus out 
Um, inside the bus uh, was all of the uh, maps of the system that we are proposing and all the information about the individual routes. So people didn't have to go to the workshop. They could just come on board our bus right there and uh, come inside, learn about what we were proposing, talk to staff, and still had comment. We had laptops on board the bus. People could provide comment right there. And uh, so this public engagement period ended, you know, the comment period ended January 11th, and uh, we actually extended the comment period. Originally, it ended off on December 23rd, but we extended it here to January 11th. Now, uh, where is Baltimore Link right now? Well, so the, the MTA team is currently finalizing the network design based on the comment we got. The uh, revised plan is due out this year, and of course the goal, um, as of the time I left the MTA, was to implement that entire change, all the new routes, uh, by June of 2017. So hopefully I'm still accurate in that. Of course, it's been a, a few, it's been over a month since I've been at the MTA, uh, but that was where we left it uh, when I moved on to the Texas Transportation Institute. So how did that planning process work, and how was it supported by Remix? So I just wanted to first give a shout out to Foursquare Integrated Transportation Planning. I put their website up here. You know, the, they, are, they were our main planning consultant on this, on this project, and they did the majority of the heavy lifting when it came to actually putting the service plan together. It wouldn't have been possible without them and their help, and they dedicated a lot of staff time in a short amount of time to help pull this off. Um, we also used Remix, uh, and we used it jointly with more traditional tools. So we had ArcGIS going as well as Excel, uh, spreadsheets that were created, and um, really we did Remix and the typical traditional tools in parallel. And uh, I really saw this chance, this project uh, was a chance to really test Remix's capabilities. What could it help us do faster than your typical approaches? And, uh, and um, how well does it work in this type of environment? So uh, we did both at the same time, using ArcGIS, Excel, and using Remix, and um, so we accomplished quite a bit with that. The two main ways that we really ended up using Remix the most uh, during this project was during planning and um, also internal education and outreach. And I'll just unpack that a little bit. How did Remix help us make planning decisions? Really in two key ways. Um, you know, it was helpful to us when we were debating route alignments, like, you know, should we put this route over here or over there? Which street should we go? Obviously, you know, which street you put a bus route on requires local knowledge of street infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure and all that as well. Um, but when it comes to aligning routes in the most efficient way in the most high density corridors, Remix has a lot of tools to help you um, assess that. We also use Remix uh, to help us plan uh, a network design. We're having network design debate. So I'm going to dive into these sort of two examples. We'll start with the network design example. And um, basically, very early on in the planning process, we had a debate about how to design the CityLink system. We were going to consolidate the CityLink routes onto fewer corridors, let's say five corridors or less, um, so that um, we had just a few select streets that had CityLink buses on them, um, or would we spread the CityLink services throughout the Baltimore region? And, uh, and so that was the uh, ongoing debate we had in the beginning. One of the ways that we answered this debate uh, very quickly, we didn't have a lot of time to uh, build out, you know, both networks all the way under using traditional methods like ArcGIS and then actually measure how well the systems work. So we, um, could, but you could very quickly whip up a transit network in Remix and, uh, and then compare, uh, you know, the network you build in Remix like network A and network B and you can compare them together and look at how well they perform. And so we built up the, what we call the consolidated network. That's where we had fewer corridors. And uh, we also whipped up the, uh, the uh, chosen network, the one we ended up with, where we had the city links spread out in a grid. And we uh, built those both in Remix, and we compared them to, to one another when it came to travel time. And so we would uh, use a tool called Jane and drop Jane on a map uh, on the uh, consolidated network, and we drop Jane on the exact same map in the final chosen network and look at how far Jane could travel. And so. Um, Here's a screenshot of um, our actual work there where we, uh, we would put Jane in, in particularly important places that we knew um, were important. And the one example here is Cherry Hill in Baltimore. Cherry Hill is the region of Baltimore uh, that has high transit propensity, um, and, but it's also very isolated. So they really need good transit down there, and um, it's very tough to get to. And so we drop Jane here on the map, and what you're seeing here are the, the, uh, time, the, the time circles 
uh, how far she can travel in uh, 15, 30, 45, and 60 minutes, and the, the pink is 60 minutes on transit, including transfers and walking. And so uh, this, if we look at this and kind of compare this. This is the consolidated network, and then we compare that to our grid-type network. This is the chosen network uh, system that we had designed. And basically, we just compare these back and forth and say, well, which one gives us better results when it comes to what you can get to? And uh, the chosen network delivers transit or um, adds into your transit shed these three places that currently, that previously were unserved under the consolidated network. And so I'll just point that out one more time. So this is the consolidated network, the one with fewer corridors, the network we went with, the one um, with the grid, and uh, you know there are particular areas that are added to the transit um, shed, and we knew these areas were important for Cherry Hill. And so we said, hey, this is a, we need to go with this network. So let's let's look at another place. You know, we can't let one location determine our entire network design. So uh, another example was the Amazon Distribution Center, was which um, opened um, um, uh, a major warehouse with 2,000 or 3,000 employees in southwest Baltimore. And so we looked at that area as well. And we looked at several others, but this here is a second example. And so this is how far Jane could get on the consolidated network. Um, and then how far she could get on our grid or our chosen network. Now, the difference between these two is really obvious. I don't think I need to put ovals on it in order for you to see. Now, some of that's based, you know, uh, on a, it's based on a lot of factors. But um, this, we dropped Jane in several other locations throughout Baltimore. And then, you know, by and large, we said, you know what, every time we've done this, the, the weight of the transit shed is in favor of our chosen network, the grid type system. Uh, improves travel times far more tr far more than the consolidated network, and so that's what we ended up going with um, with our, uh, our our basic network design, and we filled in the holes from there. So uh, Remix was really really valuable to help us with that. Um, also with route design, so it's, uh, you know when you're talking about route design, you're really getting down to the nitty gritty about which street am I putting this on, where am I putting the bus stops, and so when you're trying to pick a route alignment, you know, obviously there's Lots of different ways you could connect from point A to point B. And uh, it's hard to do if you're just looking at a map, uh, you know, and you don't really have data to back up exactly where the route should go. And uh, there's these data layers in Remix that you can easily turn on and off um, that are very, very valuable to transit planners. This, for instance, this population density of the same exact um, area. And so I can see that I've planned this transit route um, in hitting the pockets of high density pretty well. You can also look at low income. So this is uh, the uh, density of low income um, households and also the density of car-free households. And these layers are all available um, built into the Remix tool. And so we could quickly turn these on and look at our alignments and say, well, you know what? We need to change this alignment because we're missing this high density area or this low income area over here. And so if you, you, know, you can kind of draw the most efficient line to hit the best areas. Now, um, so that was how we use Remix during the planning process. Really, with network design, help us to pick the overall structure, and then it's route planning. Um, we also use Remix during our internal staff education. You know, if you're proposing to completely reboot an entire bus system that's been in place for years and years and years, um, it takes a lot of education. What are you even proposing? And so our operators, our trainers, our planners, our schedulers, people that weren't involved, you know, and, and even the people that were involved, you know, you need to go be able to back and say, well, what did we decide to do? And um, the remix map of, of, the, uh, of the new network really was extremely useful because it uh, has a lot of benefits and a lot of information built in. Typically, you know, if you're going to try to train all these folks on the network, you're going to have to develop an extensive set of maps or other sort of visuals. Um, you know, even though you're not done, you, know, you might have a, uh, a, P a PDF book that's 100 pages long that you have to print out and give to people and say, here's all our proposals. Um, with Remix, you can just share the link, right? You can just copy the link and paste it and let people look at it. And there's so many pieces of information available um, at the network level, at the route level. And so this here is just one of our local link routes. You know, So if I'm a transit planner and I need to understand what they're proposing to do with this new route called the 77, um, I can see that you know that route's uh, trace right here. I can see all the bus stops. I can see the service levels. Uh, right here, I can see how often it runs and what time it starts, what time it stops. I can see how much it costs. All that information is available in one place, and I don't have to go look up at a separate spreadsheet in order to look at that. 
Also, I can zoom in, right, and get more detail about a particular portion of the rough, and I can be panning east and west on this and get down to that nitty-gritty, you know, why I turn left here, right here, left here. Um, also, which is highly, you know, incredibly useful for planners, trainers, schedulers. They need this level of information um, in order to be able to do their job. And so, um, you know, this is hot, incredibly valuable when it comes to training staff. And you can answer customer questions about which way does the route really go, answer politician uh, questions, elected official questions about what we're really doing here. And every staff then has the information available to them without any trouble. Now, um, those are the main ways that we use Remix. In order to get there, to actually use Remix at the end in terms of the education, we had to, of course, build the whole Remix map. And um, this, this section of the presentation this introduces you to how we did that. So uh, working in Remix, so if you, if you don't know this, um, only one person can work on a map at a time. Um, and then that person owns the editing rights to that map. And so, um, you know, that's unless you make your own copy of the map, then you can edit that, and then you kind of perpetuate the process. We had uh, five, you know, I just want to back up, that's not uncommon to any, uh, you know, any data, any uh, any sort of document in Excel workbook works the same way, right? Um, but so the MTA way, the way we were had five staff working to develop this remix map at two different locations. And uh, so how, I want to talk to you about how we kind of work that process. And um, we use a software called Trello to project manage. And uh, I put the link up there as well um, to give them a little shout out. And uh, Trello basically consists of three levels of information. We have boards, which are sort of where you put all the information about a big project. And uh, inside a board, then you have lists. And then inside a list, you have cards. So sort of the three levels. And here's a graphic. This is a board. This is actually our network design board. And we had all these uh, information that the, the project team all could look at. And um, so this is a board here. And inside the board, there are several lists. We had a list for documents, for remix edits that needed to be done, questions that we had to answer. And inside each list, there are cards, the little white blocks. And uh, we had a readme card, a network design card, and all that. And so we actually had a card called remix creation. And inside that card is where we kept all the information about making our remix map. We had several people working on this map. Our process was actually pretty simple in the end. Um, we kept the most recent version of our Remix map on the Trello card. So right in Remix, you can share a map via a link. So we had a link. We kept that on the Trello card, and then we just kept that link there. This is the most recent version. And so when somebody was ready to go work on the Remix map, they would notify what I call the Remixers. Uh, they're a team of people working on the map. They would notify and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working on the map now. And you can use Trello's built-in messaging um, tools in order to do that. Uh, I didn't have to send an email or anything. And then that person would uh, click on the link in the Trello. That would open up the map. They can make a copy of the map in their Remix account. And then they would start editing. Now, um, once they were done editing, they would complete their work. And then they would share it. And then grab the link from the upper, uh, as you can see here, grab this link. They would copy it and paste it back into the Trello and then notify the team, hey, I'm done. Here's the new link. And it would keep that link on the Trello card. So basically, the, you know, the, the, the map of record, the, the authoritative map, was always available via a link in Trello. And everybody uh, worked off of that. Now, uh, this is a screenshot of that card, that Remix Creation card that was in Trello. And you can see here, that's sort of where we had the link. And, uh, and uh, so if I wanted to open up the most authoritative version of the map, I would click on that link, and that would take me to Remix uh, map. And uh, because there's so much to do when it comes into tracing um, all of these routes, we divide it into four levels of work, route tracing, level of service, bus stops, and then QA, QC. And so we set up these checklists in order to go through the process of building these. And uh, this is just a quick little scroll down through our checklist. And we had route tracing. We had every single route then that we knew needed to be traced in Remix. When you know that's the process of just drawing the line on the map. Then the levels of service for every single route, that's your span and your frequency. And then we also had bus stop locations for every single route, and then QA, QC. And so that's how we kept track. You know, nobody was assigned anything in particular. Uh, we just knew we had to do it in that process. You would go in, pick the route you wanted to do, check it when you were done, and then keep the process going. And that worked really well. It was a very, very efficient way to keep the project going without a lot of micromanagement. Um, 
So overall, you know, Remix really helped support um, this fast process. We had a lot to get done in a short period of time and a lot of people to train in a short period of time. Um, and so the two big gains we had with Remix, you know, was we were, we were able to analyze competing network designs very easy, very early on with, without a lot of work and investment. Basically, we did that network comparison where we did uh, the consolidated versus the full network, the one we chose. It took us a day, right, to really do that. And that's not a waste of time. Um, and uh, so it was really easy to, to put that together. Um, also, you know, it supported our internal outreach. You know, when I could pass that link around, people did not have to have ArcGIS installed on their machines. They did not have to have any skills in ArcGIS. They didn't really even have to know how to use Excel. Everything was just there on the Remix map at the network level, the route level, the streets, and the stops. To have that much information in one place is a huge training tool, and uh, we really found it useful for there. Now, at MTA, they have a lot of things in progress. You know, when I left, we were working on creating a GTFS uh, data set of the new network, and actually that's exporting as a GTFS is a built-in tool in Remix. Uh, so eventually, we want to analyze travel time savings under the new system. You know, how well does this new system move people throughout the region? And you can do that analysis um, in different types of tools as long as you have a GTFS data, data set. Um, that would allow us, and allow us to calculate different performance metrics. Um, and so hopefully that's underway. Uh, as far as I know, when I left, that was still going. Um, so at the bottom of this here, you, you have my contact information if you have other questions for me, uh, my email address, phone number, and then the link to the, uh, the group where I work at the Texas Transportation Institute, or TTI. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this presentation, about Remix, or about the work at TTI in any way I can help you out. And uh, with that, that's the end of my presentation. I want to turn it back over to Paul, and uh, he can finish out. Thanks so much, Michael, and, and I wanted to say how fortunate we are to have Michael with us just to be able to share about this, this process and, and one that's obviously going to be very transformative for Baltimore. Uh, in addition to that, we're just also very thankful for the fact that uh, if you weren't aware already, Michael, uh, in doing this process is one of our, our, our biggest power users, Remix, so he can really uncover a lot of these tips and tricks that other, uh, others that may not have found yet or, or be interested in having. Uh, so again, thank you uh, for sharing all of that great information. Just a couple of quick questions that I think have been posed from uh, some of our users and, and people that had uh, previously signed into the webinar. Uh, one question was, uh, given the magnitude of this change, uh, how did the public react uh, given that you, you had put together some pretty bold, uh, big and bold new ideas? Was there anxiety? Was there excitement? Uh, what generally was the reaction from the public meetings? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, we had sort of the whole gamut, kind of depend on who you ask. You know, we had a lot of excitement um, because it was finally doing something for the Baltimore bus system and people really wanted to see an improved transit system. There's been a lot of articles about how the transit system in Baltimore is holding back people from opportunity. Um, and so there was, a, there was a lot of excitement. Um, in fact, I even had bus operators coming up to me and, you know, saying, I'm so glad you guys are doing this. About time. Thank you so much. I hope this really gets through. Um, Obviously, with the service change proposal of this magnitude, there's also a lot of trepidation and fear, and uh, um, you know, and that sort of anger, you know, sort of a, a thing happening as well. So you know, there are uh, one seat rides that turn, turn into two seat rides, and and people are confused, and so uh, we had that um, going on, and uh, you know, we did our best to make sure we communicated clearly about uh, all the uh, changes. People understood everything they could possibly understand. Um, and to make it easier to understand uh, for them, you know, that personal trip. Um, and so, um, in the end, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement around it. Uh, and I think uh, with the customer feedback we got during the public outreach period, it's only going to get better from this point. And I think Baltimore will be better, better for it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks for sharing that. One other thing that uh, people were curious about was was uh, the fact that. Uh, you initially had the BNIP project, but then moved on to Baltimore market. And I think between what you guys are describing, what Houston has recently done, uh, more agencies are interested in doing these network redesigns and taking these big steps. And, and so I would say that maybe you got a chance to do it uh, one and a half or almost two times in a short amount of time. So given those experiences, uh, what would you say uh, any, any lessons learned that would be if you were to do this a third time around? Not that that's coming up anytime soon, but uh, yeah, what would be some, some key takeaways? Uh, yeah, hopefully not anytime soon. But um, I mean, 
I, I, I would recommend trying to do it in 60 days, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a major way, uh, or at least uh, not for public outreach at that point. You know, I mean, it's a, it was a lot of work, uh, and it was a lot of long days from a lot of people in order to try to pull that off. Um, in terms of other lessons learned, you know, I think uh, the more data you have available at your fingertips in the very, very beginning, uh, the better your process is going to be. And setting clear standards from the very beginning about what you want to try to accomplish and what you want to maximize and minimize in your planning efforts, because there's so many different ways to try to, you know, build a transit system. Um, and then highly, highly, highly recommend, you know, uh, as much local participation as possible by people that really know your city, um, you know, and and uh, even beyond just the, the planners that might know the city, but also your uh, your residents and your sort of transit super users. We had several involved in our uh, planning process, and they proved to be invaluable assets for us. And if I had it over to do over again, I would have a, a couple more uh, just to, to, to bounce ideas off of and to really help us avoid any big major mistakes. Great. Well, well, again, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much, Michael, for, for being part of this. You're a very first guest presenter on our Remix Transit Talk series, and, and I think you did a fantastic job. And, and just for those that are watching, uh, for those of you playing along at home, just to know that we are doing uh, a future Transit Talks uh, coming up in March. And we are still looking for topics of discussion, so if you have something you're interested in sharing, please do reach out to me, uh, paulagetremix.com. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, and we will talk to you all again soon. Thank you.